to organize society, the state, and culture in such a way that the dependence of change on crisis diminishes. More room for transformation with less dependence on trauma as the requirement of transformation. Now take the global financial and economic crisis of 2007 to 2009 and the subsequent economic slump, especially in many of the rich economies. It is a crisis, but it is not a crisis of the dimension of those great crises of the 20th century. It seems not to have been enough. It provided an opportunity for transformation, and the opportunity for transformation that it provided seems already to have been largely squandered. The lesser the crisis, it seems, the greater the role of the imagination. The role of the imagination, in a sense, would be to do the work of crisis without crisis. One of our goals, one of the goals of the progressives on this view, would be to introduce a series of innovations in the organization of the economy, of democratic politics, and of culture that would weaken this link between change and crisis and allow the impulse to transformation to become internal, endogenous. But there is a vicious circle that we must confront in this exercise. The introduction of such innovations, innovations that would diminish the dependence of change on crisis, itself seems to depend on crisis. How are we to break this vicious circle? So no project and no crisis, or not enough crisis, and not enough project. The third dimension of the predicament is no agent. The historical constituency of the left, of the progressives, in most of the modern societies in the 19th and 20th centuries was the industrial labor force, the organized industrial labor force established in the capital intensive sectors of the economy. But the problem is that the organized industrial labor force in every contemporary society now seems to be a shrinking part of the population. It is seen by the rest of the society and it ultimately comes to see itself not as the bearer of the universal interests of humanity, but as simply one more special interest among all the others. And this change is anchored in a transformation 
in the forms of production. The importance, the centrality of the organized industrial labor force seems to be intimately related to what we now call mass production. The large-scale production of standardized goods and services through rigid machines and production processes, semi-skilled labor, and very hierarchical and specialized work relations. That was the model of industrial organization that prevailed from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. It was preceded by a form of production that was decentralized and organized on the basis of a network of contractual relations. The form that, for example, Karl Marx describes as the putting out system in the early chapters of Das Kapital. And it now seems to be increasingly followed by a form of decentralization or contractualization of labor that is in many respects analogous to that earlier form. There are more petty bourgeois, more small-scale proprietors and entrepreneurs and adventurers, urban and rural in the world today, than there are organized industrial workers. And if we define this petty bourgeois aspiration subjectively rather than objectively, it may include the majority of living humanity aspiring to modest prosperity and independence. The European left, however, elected this class as its adversary. And this class is now the most important class in the world from the standpoint of sheer influence in the mass of humanity. So what should the progressives do in their thinking about their main constituency, their social base? it seems they confront a dilemma. One horn of the dilemma is to insist on their privileged relation to this historical base. And that is a characteristic move of what I call the recalcitrant left. The other horn of the dilemma is to break the link with this historical base and to accept that they have no particular his social constituency whatsoever. They then appeal in general to the whole of society. And that is the move that has been preferred on the whole by what I call the resign left. Neither of these two options seems promising for the promotion of the historical objectives of the left. One leaves it in the hands of an ally that represents just a faction of contemporary society. And the other leaves it without any definite social base whatsoever. Now, the fourth dimension of this predicament of the contemporary progressives 
not enough of a project, not enough of a crisis, not enough of an agent or constituency, and no reliable way of thinking or form of discourse. Now let me introduce this fourth dimension of the predicament in the following way. By describing a characteristic dilemma or embarrassment in any contemporary programmatic debate. If I propose to you some reform in contemporary society that is very distant from what exists, you may say, that's interesting, but it's utopian. And if I propose something that is close to what exists, you can respond, it's feasible, but it's trivial. In the contemporary situation, anything that can be proposed will appear to be either utopian or trivial. How did we come into this situation? How did we make ourselves vulnerable to this false rhetorical dilemma that threatens to paralyze and to demoralize the programmatic imagination? The presupposition of this idea that any proposal is either utopian or trivial is a misunderstanding of the character of a programmatic argument. A programmatic argument properly conceived is not about a blueprint. It is about a succession of steps from the here and now to somewhere else. What matters is the direction. And any direction worth thinking about can be described at points relatively close to what exists or relatively far from what exists. Any powerful programmatic vision has two major attributes. The first attribute is that it marks a direction as a succession of steps. It is not like architecture, it is like music. And the second attribute is that it defines very concretely the first steps by which to begin movement along that path, the adjacent possible. But it seems that what is generating this misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument is a fundamental feature of our intellectual situation. The absence of reliable ideas about how structural change takes place in history. We have no such reliable ideas. We are no longer able to believe in the large-scale narratives of structural transformation such as Marxism, with their prediction of a relentless succession of forms of social and economic life. And these large narratives 
of historical transformation have been replaced 